Hello and welcome to Inside Fingal, the podcast that gives you an insight into the work being done by the councillors and staff of Fingal County Council to make Fingal a better place to live, work, visit and do business in. My name is Jerry McDermott. I'm the Media and Communications Manager here at Fingal County Council and I hope you'll stay with me as we continue to inform you about the work of your local authority. In this episode of Inside Fingal, we're going to look at our beaches. Fingal is lucky that along our 88 kilometres of coastline, we have some fabulous beaches and they attract people all year round. But it's during the summer, when the sun is shining, that we see people flocking to them. And today we're going to look at some of the things that Fingal County Council is doing to make the beaches safe and enjoyable for everybody, while at the same time protecting the unique environment along our coasts. In this programme, we're going to hear about lifeguards, bathing water quality, and also a special project that has been carried out to restore and protect Donabate Beach. And we'll also explain why the two-minute beach clean is an important thing to do every time you visit the beach. Well, our first guest on this episode of Inside Fingal is Maria Mungi. And Maria is a water safety development officer with the operations department of Fingal County Council. And among the duties of a water safety development officer is to look after the lifeguards who man our beaches during the summer. You're very welcome to Inside Fingal. Um, how many lifeguards do you look after during a summer? Um, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, so the council employs 35 beach lifeguards each year to um, man the lifeguard stations on our designated building areas. And how many beaches would they be on duty at? So we have 10 designated bathing areas that are lifeguarded this season. So a designated bathing area is determined by the number of users, its accessibility, um, if it's not like a working harbour or subject to strong tidal activities. So our main beaches are Balbriggan Beach, Scary South Beach, Loch Shinny, Rush North, Rush South, the Brook in Portran, Velvet Strand, Port Marnock, Borough Beach, Sutton and Claremont Beach in Hoth. We also man Malahide Beach, which is not a designated bathing area, but Water Safety Ireland have recommend that we keep it lifeguarded. Um, this is due to uh, dangerous currents in the area. There's a deep channel there as well. And it also has a lot of marine traffic to the marina in Malahide. So that's why that is lifeguarded, even though it's a no swimming beach. And um, I suppose one obvious question is, why are not all the beaches in, in Fingal or maybe popular swimming spots like, say, High Rock in Malahide or the Captains and Scaries? Why, why are they not manned with lifeguards d- during the summer? So we would get suggestions for locations to be identified at bathing areas. So we've recently requested submissions from the public um, to identify any areas that they think um, would be suitable as uh, bathing areas for 2022. Um, So we're currently reviewing those submissions. But some of the reasons why we mightn't identify an area, um, one of them would be the sampling of water. If it can't take place safely, then obviously we can't get a water sample, so we won't know the water quality in the area. There can also be issues with access to the beach. So sometimes the lands can be in private ownership. They are not universally accessible to all, or there might be an issue with um, getting a casualty out of the area, such as steep steps and things like that. Um, Also, we could have an issue where we can't actually locate a lifeguard station on that particular beach due to strong tidal activity in the area. Um, It could also be that the beach is very, very rocky. So it means that the likelihood is swimmers are going to get injured. So the lifeguards be spending most of their time trying to patch up people. Um, And other locations we might get asked are harbours, but some of our harbours are actually working harbours. So obviously that's a conflict between bathers and obviously fishermen. So obviously that wouldn't really be appropriate. Yeah. So there's an awful lot of things are taken into consideration when you're deciding whether a beach should have a lifeguard or not. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of things to be looked at and checked. You know, obviously, you know, we want to make sure people have accessibility to beaches in their area, but we have to really be mindful of whether they're they're safe and in particular safe to novice swimmers. Okay, so let's go back to the lifeguards. Um, What what do they do um, when they're in position? 
Um, so the main duty of a beach lifeguard is really to supervise the activities um, at the bathing area that they're stationed. So what we want our lifeguards to do is basically prevent drowning accidents um, and basically stop anything that's risky before it actually happens. Um, they'll also obviously provide emergency rescue service um, if there is an accident. So if someone is struggling and is in difficulty in the water, they might go out on the rescue board and bring that casualty in. Um, and they'd also do first aid would be their main thing. So cuts, jellyfish stings, they'd get a few calls to the hut. Um, they're also there in advisory capacity. So um, people will ask them, you know, about the local area, where are the toilets, you know, where's the nurse shop. Some people would have questions about the tides and um, if there's any hazards there. We'd also get questions kind of uh, in July, possibly August, you know, or have you seen jellyfish in the waters yet? You know, they'll, they'll fill in their daily log. So when they go in in the morning, they set up the station, they'll fly the, the flag for the day, they'll put out their patrol zone flags. Um, and that's how you know which area that they're, they're going to be patrolling in. They also check the general uh, weather conditions for the day and what the tide is like and the tide times. They'll also note if they've been asked to change the flag for any reason. So if it's very stormy or if it gets very misty or foggy, they might have to change the flag to a red flag. So they'll note that as well. They obviously have to do um, instant uh, forms. So they'll fill in if an instant happens. Um, they'll fill in if they had to perform first aid and things like that. Um, they also inspect the patrol area and just look for hazards and anything that they can remove um, hazard wise they will do and if they anything that they can't deal with they will ring the supervisor which is generally myself and um, who's on call and they basically um, one of the most important things that they do in the morning is to make sure that all the equipment is okay so they'll be checking their supplies um, they'll be checking that everything is working. In particular, the AED is working. So all our stations have an AED that works and is there to be used. And, and an AED, for, for those that don't know, is a defibrillator, isn't that correct? Defibrillator, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did actually yeah. have to perform CPR last year on one of the beaches. So the lifeguards are there, they're trained and they're, they're ready to take action. So if you see someone in difficulty and you're near the lifeguard station, please do call in. And the lifeguards will assist yeah. you. And how and how do you choose your lifeguards? Yeah, so it's a it's a bit of a long winded process. Um, so um, basically, our our lifeguards would attend training sessions privately. So um, they would go to the likes of Irish Water Safety classes or the Royal Life Saving Society classes or an equivalent of that, and they would attend kind of classes and then they do kind of practical elements either in the pool or on a beach and with the aim to achieve a beach lifeguard certificate so if you want to work as a beach lifeguard you need this certificate in order to work and um, so sometimes the beach lifeguard certificate it can be may before they do their practical element out on the beach so we do accept applications from people who have a current cert or who are in the process of renewing or carrying out their first cert. Um, but the main part of the recruitment process is that they attend an interview with ourselves so we can get a feel for the candidates, test their knowledge, and throw them a couple of scenarios that we know they might get out on the beach. And then they would complete what's known as a pool test. So they'd be timed swim perform a rescue and they'd be scored on that and then the the two scores from the interview and the pool tests are added together and they'd be offered employment based on that once they have their certificate and um, with covid this year and last year we had to change from a pool test to actually doing the test on the beach and um, so god love them they were frozen out of it but at least they they were allowed to wear their wetsuits so they were they're were okay this time was that a better way of doing it in that, you know, their work during the summer is in the sea and that was, was it a better test because it was in the sea this for the last two years? The beach test is probably better because it is the conditions, but you're heavily reliant on the way the tides are. 
so we need we need water so it's it's sometimes the tides are against us for doing out in the yes beach, but it worked out for us anyway this year so like from what you're saying and, and what you've outlined there in in the in your answers to the last couple of questions lifeguards have to have a lot of skills don't they yeah yeah huge amount of skills yeah yeah um and you know because of what they have to deal with on the beach, you know, they have to inspire confidence. So members of the public that might be nervous about being on the beach, they need to feel confident that the lifeguards are watching, that they are patrolling. And they also need to remain calm in the face of crisis, be it a rescue um, or be it, you know, we've had a few missing children on the beach this, this season. So it can be very frightening for the, the child themselves, but also for the parents especially when they last seen the child beside the water, which is obviously a very frightening scenario. So just to highlight like a missing kid, you know, the lifeguards will obviously help. Sometimes we have to call in the guardie and sometimes if the child was last seen near the water, it's protocol for us to call the Coast Guard. So just to emphasize for people that you know, don't be scared if the lifeguard rings the Coast Guard or the Guardie. It's normal procedure. The lifeguard is very much part of a, of a wider emergency services team um, oh, yeah. that, 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 can, that can respond to incidents on the beach. Yeah, so our, our, our lifeguards, like, you know, it's a very, very long day for them. They're there from 11 to 7. They have to keep their concentration up. They have to be alert. Um, they have to react quickly when someone is in danger. And they also have um, a good working relationship with the emergency services. So when we have our lifeguard induction day, we invite the guardie, um, the fire brigade and the coast guard um, and they give a talk. So we have done a training exercise actually um, this month with the coast guard to see our communication skills, to understand the phrasing that the Coast Guard uses in emergency, and also to see the equipment and know how to use the equipment that the Coast Guard have so that if the lifeguards have to assist the Coast Guard, there's that work and relationship and knowledge there. So you're constantly trying to upskill them and keep the skills there. Um, they're also like working as a team, their knowledge of first aid and to perform it and they will re make recommendations. You know, if they think you should be going to a doctor, they'll tell you you need to go to the doctor. They'll call the ambulance for you if it's required. And um, they also try and explain the beach bylaws to um, individuals on the beaches. You know, they might arrive in the morning and there's kite surfers out they will explain to the kite surfers that they need to move out of the bathing area, the patrol zone, um, because obviously we don't want a clash between the kite surfers and those down for a swim. And they'll also answer uh, questions from people. So our lifeguards, when they first start, are encouraged to ask questions of a, a more experienced lifeguard and also not to be afraid to ask questions of locals because local knowledge is uh, extremely valuable um, out on the beaches. So they'll also know the tide time. So I've noticed myself when I'm out on my rounds the weekend, people will go up to the lifeguard in Hoth and will ask, can we walk around to Sutton right now? The lifeguards will check the tide timetable and they'll advise accordingly. So some people are told, no, the tide is about to come in. And then others are told, look, if you'll get around to Sutton, you might not make it back. So people can make their own decision based on that. And when a member of the public goes along to a beach, maybe a beach that they're not familiar with, uh, how will they know if, if swimming is allowed? So if it's a designated bathing area, you'll see the lifeguard station is out. Um, so if it's safe to swim, the flag on top of the hut will be red over yellow. And that means that there's a lifeguard on duty and that it's safe to swim between the two patrol flags. Um, if it's not safe, you'll see a red flag instead, which means that you shouldn't swim. And then if you don't see a flag at all, it means the lifeguard isn't on duty. Um, so if there's another location that isn't designated, um, if we have prohibited swimming there, you'll see a no swimming sign. But also you may see some signage that says dangerous currents, competent swimmers only, or you may see something um like out in Baldoyle towards the end of Port Marnock, soft sand signs. So we're recommending that you don't try and walk when the tide is out in these areas because you could become trapped with the tide coming in. 
And I suppose, you know, one question that springs to mind is, is why are the lifeguards not on duty all year round? Because we've obviously seen a huge growth in um, in all year round swimming in the, in the last year, certainly since COVID arrived. Um, so providing a lifeguard service outside of the bathing season can be misleading as people may think that it's safe to swim um, along the coast. So outside of the bathing season, the wet, the temperature of the water is extremely cold. So you could get a lot of people suffering from hypothermia. Um, the weather is also very unpredictable and we get a lot more um, stormy weather with high tides. Um, our lifeguards would have done their beach fitness test for um, employment in the Maybank Kylo Day weekend and they had their wetsuits on, were fully prepared and even though they were in the water for a short period of time, they were frozen after coming out of the water. Um, I, I don't think people realise that our, our lifeguard stations themselves are just metal containers. They don't have heating, they don't have electricity um, and they don't have toilets or anything like that. So they're they're kind of practical for use during the summer season. They wouldn't be as practical for the winter season. So it'd be quite uncomfortable for the lifeguards to be sitting there um, for eight hours um, in, in the depths of winter. Um, even during the summer, we'd have a lot of quiet days where there wouldn't be very many people on the beach, especially when it's cloudy or there's rain forecast. So th- like that would be the same case, say, over the winter. So it wouldn't be practical to have uh, lifeguards employed to sit on a beach that's pretty much empty by a couple of swimmers. OK, um, so so there's plenty, plenty of reasons there. Um, if, if we do decide to go swimming this summer um, and that, what, what should we be thinking of and what should we be doing in, in order to swim so safely? Um, so I would recommend that people keep an eye out on our own website and um, social media platforms. You'll see the list of uh, lifeguard stations that are going to be open for the coming week. And um, we normally run it from a Thursday to a Wednesday. Then if we have to close a hut for unforeseen circumstances, we'll um, obviously alert our comms unit who can then update the website and let people know. Um, Other resources that are quite good is the Water Safety Ireland website. So that's www.watersafety.ie. Um, there's also a summer ready campaign by the government. So it's similar to the Be Winter Ready campaign. Um, and this summer ready, it has a good few things in it, um, road safety and fire safety, but it also includes a good bit on water safety. Um, so the main tips I would have is that people swim at the designated bathing areas where obviously we have lifeguards on duty. You know, stay within your depth follow all instructions by lifeguards and pay attention to any signs, particularly what flag has been raised. Um, you can ask locals and lifeguards if there's any hazards or anything that you should be aware of, especially if you're unfamiliar with that beach. And we would also strongly recommend that people don't bring inflatable devices, air beds or floating toys to the beach or any aquatic location. Um, these toys are not suitable for Irish weather and Irish conditions, and you can blow offshore very quickly, um, depending on the weather. So rescues last year um, were on the rise outside of the bathing season in particular. It was something that was highlighted in the Coast Guard's annual report. And I read on Twitter this morning that the RNLI had to carry out a rescue there of two people on an inflatable device. Um, Last year, our own lifeguards had to perform a rescue and thankfully the the breeze was not offshore. So the the woman and her child were blown up the beach as opposed to out into the open water. So we would definitely recommend that people just stay away from inflatable devices. Don't even buy them. If you don't have a designated bathing area near you, um, then we would say to swim at the safer traditional bathing areas um, and pay particular attention to whether there are ring buoys in place. Um, So always make sure the ring buoy is there before you get in the water and make sure that you can actually get in and out of the water safely. So not just that I can dive in off this rock. You have to think of how can I get out when I'm done swimming. Um, We would recommend that people look up the tides and not to jump or dive in as well because it can be very rocky and you don't see it from above you know stay within your depth swim parallel to shore don't swim alone as well would be another 
kind of particular thing to do and never put pressure you know if you're with your group of friends never put pressure on someone who doesn't want to get into the water if they're not comfortable getting in just leave them to it and also um enter like our water as i said before is very cold so if you enter slowly to let your body acclimatize to the temperature of the water and if you end up in a rip current and it's sweeping out to sea remain calm and just swim parallel to shore until you're free of this current and then you can swim back to shore we'd also recommend that you don't swim in quarries esb um ESB reservoir or anything like that just come to our designated bathing areas where you're going to be minded by the lifeguards and it's a lot safer to swim well that's great Maria and uh, thank you so much indeed for sharing that with us uh, I think we've all got a, a, a new insight into the work that goes on in, in on our beaches and um, you know the work especially being done by lifeguards um, thank you so much for joining us on Inside Fingal today and uh, keep up the good work thanks Terry. thanks a million So lifeguards are very much part and parcel of a Fingal summer and so too is the regular testing for bathing water quality. That's carried out by Fingal County Council's Water Pollution Section, which is part of the Environmental Climate Action and Active Travel Department. And I'm joined now by James Wall, who is a Senior Executive Engineer in the Water Pollution and Waste Enforcement Section. James, thanks for joining us on Inside Fingal. And I'll ask you by, or I'll start by asking you how you go about testing the bathing water in Fingal. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, basically, samples are taken um, in what is known as a standard reference method, um, basically from compliance points at each beach by um, actually environmental health officers take our samples for us. Um, they're taken in about a, a meter depth of water and uh, they're taken to an accredited lab within within four hours where cultures are, are, are grown, basically. Um, both E. coli and, enter, and intestinal enterococci, are the, the, those are the two parameters which are chosen to indicate uh, water quality. Confirmed results generally available within 48 hours after sampling. These individual results are, are used to detect whether anything unusual might have happened in the in the bathing water in the, in the previous hours or days. And if so, um, what what action might might be needed? There's a there's an action table which has been developed by the health uh, the HSE and it determines what response is required. Overall quality for bathing water is assessed over four years. So I could I could um, I could go into that if you want uh, in terms well, like, of how that's assessed, you know. Yeah, no, I think people would be interested in that because um, you know sometimes they, they they mightn't be aware that it's done over four years and and that the the decisions that are made in regard to beaches is because of those results over the previous four years. Uh, yes, uh, yes, indeed, uh, and it, uh, I can understand why there might be some confusion. Um, you you can you can get a, a very good like an excellent result on a on a single sample result and yet the beach might be classified in a different way. That classification takes as I say takes place on a four year um, statistical basis. The reason for an applying an assessment like that is that it gives you a, a better overall assessment of the background quality of the beach and of the, vi- the vulnerability of the beach. So the annual water quality rating, um, it doesn't necessarily, as, as we said, it doesn't necessarily mean that the current water quality will be the same. Um, during the summer, water quality results of individual samples are reported on beaches.ie as well and are available from beach notice boards. And of course, we've had we've had a few issues in, in Fingal um, in recent years with, with beaches falling foul of that sort of four-year testing. I, I think Portran was one that was was marked down low for quite a while. And, and more recently this year, we've seen Balbriggan um, suffer the same fate. Uh, that's that's true. Um, the, and, what, and I suppose you, you look at what causes that, um, what can cause a beach to be poor. There would be an un- underlying vulnerability, I suppose, there. Um, what causes that would be Microbial contamination basically is what causes bacterial problems in waters. That's what we measure. That's that's what we're basically measuring when, when we test. And that can come from humans, can come from animals, it can come from birds. Um, it finds its way to the bathing water through s- sewage overflows, runoff from the urban or rural environment um, as well, particularly following heavy rainfall. Uh, from um, can come from streams or directly via congregation of birds, um, the presence of horses, cattle and dogs on beaches as well. And those are the type of things that which can affect water quality from time to time. Yeah. Um, and, and you have a grading system, isn't it? I think there's four different um, sort of grades that a, that a, a water waters could get. 
Yes, that's correct. The four system since 2014, the system has come into place around Europe. There's excellent, good, um, sufficient, and unfortunately, there's poor when the quality doesn't meet the, meet the minimum threshold. Um, so basically, um, excellent water quality would be where the levels of bacteria in the water are regularly low. Um, in good waters, the levels of bacteria can on occasion be a bit higher and influenced per perhaps by rainfall events, but on average, they would represent no appreciable health risk. Sufficient qu quality waters meet the minimum required criteria for bathing, but are often more prone to the influence of pollution sources such as streams, drainage or sewage discharges. But poor is where they don't meet that standard, and that's where we would have a concern. And uh, there is a there is a known link between high levels of the these um, E. coli inter intestinal intercocci, particularly the latter, and the incidence of gastroenteric illnesses. That leads you then to um, you know depending on what a, what a result is, it, it leads you then to make a number of different decisions. Um, you know, like you you can advise whether or not swimming swimming should take place, or you can you can ban swimming altogether. That's correct, uh, Jerry. Um, we we basically we would have put an advisory notice in place when, for example, the short term pollution has been predicted. Um, we're allowed to do that. That's a that's a that's us monitoring or uh, preventing or trying to prevent um, the risk of illness, and therefore uh, we would put an advisory in place to to let people know so that they can make their own decisions. Also, when medium levels of bacteria have been detected following sampling as well, we would put an advisory notice in place. We may put it in place as well if we if we come across harmful microalgae, which which can be an issue, but generally isn't in, the, in our marine waters. Um, there's also uh, an advisory called an all season advisory that's that's placed at a beach, which unfortunately has been declared as uh, having poor status. So basically, that that advises people not to against bathing but if they must do so then wash their hands before handling food avoid swimming with an open cut or wound avoid swimming if you're if if the, um if you're pregnant or have a weakened immune system so so it's important to follow the advice if you want to stay healthy you should follow whatever notices or whatever advice is in place for a particular beach would agree yes why, why does the testing only take place during the summer bathing season um testing is is mandated through the bathing water regulations, as I suppose is everything that's based on science has to be. Um, that means that it's not just the testing that matters; it's the it's the management around the around the testing that matters, and that starts off early in the year, uh, before the season starts. Um, the management of beaches involves characterising beaches, setting up risk profiles, um, reviewing those profiles putting a calendar for testing in place, putting a protocol that we would have a, a very strong protocol in Fingal where we have every every um, relevant section in the council and outside involved, for example, Irish Water in terms of pump stations um, so that we have a decision making, a decision matrix is in place. This is all done. I mean, the, the bathing season itself is, is a finite season throughout Europe. The, the minister makes a decision as to how long that season is in each country. Uh, ours is three and a half months long. It reflects the time that that the the peak bathing time of the year. And when I say bathing, I don't mean recreational sports. I mean bathing, like submersive activities. Another another question that keeps coming up um, is about real time testing. Uh, you know, you, I think you mentioned that it takes about forty eight hours for for the results to come back, and and that. Is real-time testing, um, you know, a, a, a feasible um, option at, at this stage? Um, we have looked at this. Um, it's not currently available to us. Um, it's not to say it will never be, but there's a, more data is required and the commercialization of, of the, there's a, a, a prototype in, uh, there being developed at the moment, but there aren't more. Um, it needs to be commercially available. It's not. Um, we are looking into that. Uh, it would also not be able to be used to change health advice or to change status or to, or to provide health advice or to change status. Uh, if a beach is poor, it's poor. It's um, using, a, using another form of rapid testing, which doesn't conform to the standard reference method that is prescribed in the bathing water regulations will not change the status. Only a um, 95 percentile determination that says the beach is above the minimum required will change the status from poor to sufficient or otherwise 
um, I, I suppose I could say that there are there's a lot of research going into predictive models as well and to various ways of measuring water, but it is research at this stage. Um, they all have to be, uh, I suppose, done in real time or on a, a, a scaled up basis as well to make sure that they work and that you don't have false positives as well. I I would sort of allude to some predictive models. There's a there's a huge degree of predictability in terms of water quality as well. I have to say, um, there's a there are systems around the world. The U.S. has quite a few of them where they might do a near time prediction of, of water, which is a using independent variables like rainfall or, or turbidity or whatever to indicate what the water quality is like. But that's near time. That's not telling you what it's going to be like all day. A recent study done by a, a, a very um, one of the foremost experts in bathing water sci- um, research has uh, done in Swansea Bay has found that water quality can vary within the day very quite considerably uh, and and uh, with changing conditions and from one one location to another within the same beach so it's quite it is very variable and it's largely down to the the temperate weather systems that we have that creates this variability yeah variable and complex i would say james and quite complex yeah i have to say yeah yeah so yeah as well. yeah um, why are all the beaches in Fingal not tested? I, I think you only test test about ten of them at this stage. Uh, we test we test bathing waters that are identified, um, and again there are, there's a public consultation process in place to identify beaches. They have to fulfil various criteria, such as for as most popularity would be one of them, but they also need access, um, clear clear access. They need to be safe. They need to have facilities. Um, I suppose it's uh, by having a, a bathing water identified, it's a it's a mark of confidence. It's also it's also a, a degree of some responsibility that the local authority would take on as well, if you're going to bring because um, bathing isn't just about individuals; it's about families. So there's a number of criteria, only one of which is is water quality, which have to be complied with in order to identify a beach. Once that happens, once the beach is uh, the bathing water is identified, then that it brings it into the under the bathing water regulations. Um, I will say that there is another category in between, which is called other monitored waters, and we we do have one. So, like we have ten identified plus one monitored, uh, which is um, Malahide Beach. Um, it it has other issues in terms of currents, so it'd probably never be identified. But it does avail of a of a testing regime. Um, not necessarily all of the other. Um, reporting requirements that go along with it, because everything we do is reported to the EPA, so th- uh, and uploaded uh, publicly onto beaches.ie, and uh, it forms the basis for status determination at the end of the season. And would the the testing results have an impact on whether a beach gets a blue flag or a green coast award? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, for blue flag, I think you need four years of uh, excellent status for blue flags. Um, and green coast, um, similar, uh, not as strenuous or stringent. Um, there's also obviously other factors involved in that as well. But yes, the water quality would be pre- uh, preeminent in terms of awards. So th- th- there's a lot to be done, I suppose, in, in terms of maintaining the water quality. Like, like as you say, there's so many different variables at, at play that it's it's any beach that is reporting an excellent um, water quality is, is actually doing very very well it is and and you know it has to be appreciated that it does take an awful lot of work to to manage when i say manage we don't we don't create the pollution but we and we don't necessarily have a magic wand to fix it but what we do is we we take we undertake measures management measures where where beaches are vulnerable to look to, to try and identify what might be causing the problems so there's a lot of time involved in that there's um there there from time to time is weekend working as well there's evening working it um there's a a lot of um a lot of credit i suppose needs to go to the people involved in it a lot of reporting involved and then you're constantly reporting and answering queries on it as well because obviously the public naturally would be concerned when they hear something or uh, aware of something so there's a it's it is a management system it's not just a testing system it's a management system and that's and i think that's what the what the bathing water regulations themselves are really about. 
Well, James, thank you for joining us today and giving us an insight into the work being done to make sure that the public are aware of the quality of the water at our beaches and when they can or cannot go into the water. And don't forget, if you do want to check out the water quality of your favourite beach, you can go to beaches.ie or to fingal.ie. Keeping our beaches clean while also protecting the ecosystems that exist is very important. And that's why Fingal County Council has teamed up with the Coastal Programs section within Antashka's Environmental Education Unit to conduct a pilot project to restore and protect Donna Bay Beach this summer. To find out more, we went down to the beach and we met Martina O'Connor from Fingal County Council's Operations Department and Richard Curtin, Antashka's Coastal Program Officer for Dublin. And this is what they told us. Fingal County Council is aiming to establish a more environmentally friendly way of managing our beach practices in how we clean the beach for our visitors. In order to move to more environmentally friendly practices, we are not going to use the mechanical rake on Donabate Beach this summer. We will actually leave the beach rack as it is and then work with our additional resources that we have uh, employed ourselves and the community and Clean Coast to do hand picking of the litter on the beach. Beach rack is the scientific term for seaweed, uh, driftwood and seagrass that washes up on our shores. When you leave beach rack on the beaches and it's not raked, you can see the increase in the amount of invertebrates on the, on, in the local area. And that is obviously critical for the, for the local ecology, for the local birds and other species, because it's an integral part of the, it's kind of the foundation of the beach food web. Beach rack is actually uh, critical to sand dunes. So what it does is the, the natural uh, debris from beach rack actually traps sand, and then the nutrients from that actually helps to grow marron grass and lime grass as well. So it is a critical part in developing sand dunes. We're encouraging people to even do a two minute beach clean when they're on the beach as well. So maybe spend about two minutes picking up some litter and take it home with you. If at all possible, take your rubbish home with you. If you can't take it home with you, put it in a bin. Leave no trace. Basically leave the place as it was when you arrived. And if in the process you can do a two minute beach clean while you leave the beach, that's an added bonus. If you can undertake a two minute beach clean, that'd be fantastic. And then throughout the summer months, we're going to have a number of different community cleanups. So if you're visiting Donabate for the summer or for a holiday, or even if you're living in the community, you can come join for some of the community cleanups as well. As well as the environmental aspect of this and, and the supporting of the ecosystems on the beach, it will keep our beaches beautiful. And if you're interested in taking part in any of the Clean Coast Beach Cleans, which are part of the Restore and Protect project in Donabate, you can register in advance at www.fingal.ie forward slash restore hyphen protect hyphen Donabate hyphen beach. Or you can do it through Eventbrite. The next one is scheduled for Saturday, August the 7th. So that's it for episode 11 of Inside Fingal. My thanks to Maria Mongi, James Walls, Martina O'Connor and Richard Curtin for being our guests today. And you can find out more about Fingal's magnificent beaches at fingal.ie forward slash amenities forward slash beaches. If you have any comments or suggestions in relation to the Inside Fingal podcast, please email podcast at fingal.ie. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, you can follow Fingal County Council on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and LinkedIn and also at fingal.ie. Thank you for listening. Until the next time, goodbye and stay safe. <music>